This is gospel for the fallen ones locked away in permanent slumber, assembling their philosophies from pieces of broken memories. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh. They're gnashing teeth and criminal tongues conspire against. Seen the best of us yet. If you love me, let me go. I can't believe I'm fucking crying right now. Oh my god. I finished Crooked Kingdom last night as of filming this, and I am broken. A lot of people exaggerate when they talk about being emotional over a book, but I'm not exaggerating at all when I say that my heart physically hurts. It feels so heavy and I'm just really, really sad. This book got me fucking crying in the club and I'm not even joking. I was literally sobbing at 3 a.m. last night. No mourners, no funerals is a false advertisement because I'm fucking mourning right now. I felt like the first book was a very solid read, but this one... <sighs> So let's talk about it. Let's just open some fresh wounds and pour some salt on it and just watch me cry. I was thinking for this video, I would go through all of the tabs <laughs> that I put in this story just to give you a walkthrough of like all of the points that I felt emotional. I don't know if this will actually be entertaining. I feel like it's the booktube equivalent of a relative coming back from vacation and then showing you a slideshow of like all of their pictures. You don't actually really care what they did, but they somehow think you do. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. You haven't read Crooked Kingdom, there will obviously be spoilers, so you can get the fuck out. I don't even feel bad for kicking you out because it's your fault that you haven't read it yet. The first tab takes place when Inej has been kidnapped and tortured. Like I said in my previous video, I think it's completely unnecessary for her to be kidnapped in the first place and be put into this position of damsel in distress solely for the sake of having a second book and having conflict between Kaz and Inej. But I'll be damned if I don't like some good angst. And then they're about to break her legs and and she says this. He'll never trade if you break me, she screamed, the words tearing loose from some deep place inside her, her voice raw and undefended. I'll be no use to him anymore. <sighs> this bitch really believes this and it breaks my fucking heart. And who can blame her? Her life has always been shitty and Kaz has always been shitty to her. Page 104, you lay a finger on me and Kaz Brecker will cut the baby from your pretty wife's stomach and hang its body from a balcony at the exchange. What the fuck? <laughs> Inej is kind of metal as fuck. Page 110, a conversation between Wylan and Kaz. Getting pregnant isn't actually a special talent. Ask any luckless girl in the barrel. This isn't an emotional scene. I just wanted to point out that Kaz and Inej apparently both seem to hate pregnant women. Name me a more iconic duo. Page 184, I would come for you. And if I couldn't walk, I'd crawl to you. And no matter how broken we were, we'd fight our way out together. Knives drawn, pistols blazing, because that's what we do. We never stop fighting. <laughs> I can't finish this fucking quote. <sighs> okay, page 200. I need to do this. I've never been to my mother's grave. I'm not leaving Kirch without saying goodbye. Trust me, you care more than she does. Once again, Kaz being an asshole, but also not being wrong. While we are on the topic of Wylan's mom, Let's talk about the whole chapter where he finally meets her. Cause that left me shook. I didn't even tab any scenes because the whole thing was a clusterfuck. She's alive and doesn't even recognize him because he's disguised as Kue. She paints so many beautiful paintings, including one of her son. I was like, Bitch, we really gonna fucking do this? And it's weird because I didn't think I really cared for Wyland because I usually don't like the wimpy, weaker characters, but I obviously did to some extent because I was feeling some type of way for that fucking chapter. Then on top of that, the next few chapters started going into everybody's background story with Jesper losing his mom, Matthias remembering his wolf and how his wolf is probably abandoned without him, and then Inej remembering all those nights at the menagerie. I'm like, dude, can you guys just chill the fuck out. This is not a competition to see who has the saddest background story. And I don't like being the judge of this competition. My heart can't take it, okay? Can we just be happy for once in our lives? Can we just smell vanilla and not be fucking triggered by it? No, no we cannot. If it were a competition though, 
Inesh would win because her life fucking sucks. It's awful what happened to all the other characters, but to some extent, they have lived pretty comfortable childhoods. Meanwhile, Inesh spent night after night trapped in the menagerie and having her humanity stripped away by random men. I love reading her background story. But it's also really fucking sad. <laughs> By the way, I didn't tab any Jesper and Wyland scenes because if I did, then I would run out of post-it note tabs. I would probably kill a tree if I had to mark every single gay moment there was. But believe me, I was reacting to them. I was mostly yelling, why are they so gay? Literally every scene, so gay. They were spreading their gay agenda everywhere and I was here for it. It was probably the only happy part of the book. <laughs> Page 235. They speak quietly. They don't engage in flirtations with every single man they meet. I flirt with the women too. Nina is bi? How did I not know this? This should have been so obvious. I had to put the book down and just mentally slap myself for how ignorant I was being. Of course Nina is bi. And if I think any otherwise, that is so ignorant of me. We love our bi queen. Page 324. Till this moment, Wyland hadn't quite understood how much they meant to him. His father would have sneered at those thugs and thieves, a disgraced soldier, a gambler who couldn't keep out of the red. But they were his first friends, his only friends, and Wyland knew that even if he had had his pick of a thousand companions, these would have been the people he chose. <sighs> Wyland, you better fucking stop. I'm not even supposed to like you. You can't be saying all this corny ass shit cause you know it's gonna make me tear up. The book around the 300 page range gets so good. Like consistently every chapter back to back has some shit going down. I had to stop and put the book down so many times because it was a lot to process. Like Jesper accidentally kissing Kuei right in front of Wylan. This is some gay soap opera shit. And then Jesper and Kaz, getting into a fight. I was also tearing up at this because the words that Kaz was just hurling at Jesper were so mean and so brutal. And then he accidentally calls him Jordy. This is where I had to put the book down because I was just like, no, we are not going down there. We are not going down this road. We are not even gonna touch this. I'm aware of the implications of Kaz calling Jesper his dead brother. And I don't even wanna fucking think about it. How dare you? I'm basically wildin' in the corner in this scene because I am just so shook. He doesn't want his dad to be fighting. And yeah, they're his dads. Kaz is his adoptive dad and Jesper is his daddy. I can't get through this book without talking about the bandaging scene. Page 362. It isn't easy for me either. Even now, a boy will smile at me on the street or Jesper will put his arm around my waist and I feel like I'm going to vanish. I live in fear that I'll see one of her, one of my clients on the street. For a long time, I thought I recognized them everywhere. But sometimes I think what they did to me wasn't the worst of <sighs> Oh shit. After all she had endured, he was the weak one. But she would never know what it was like for him to see Nina pull her close, watch Jesper Lufus arm through hers, what it was to stand in doorways and against walls and know he could never draw nearer. <sighs> you guys, they'll literally never fuck. Kaz can barely peck her on the neck without shitting his pants. I'm shitting my pants. I haven't read fanfiction in years, but after this, I'm gonna have to look up fanfic for these two because I have no idea how they would be able to make physical contact beyond what just happened. Now we gotta wait like 500 more pages before maybe Kaz will peck her on the cheek. Real talk though, this is one of the most fascinating things that I find about their relationship. There's so much inner turmoil and this battle between hating the physical contact and and wanting it so badly at the same time. Honestly, it's kind of fucking hot. I'm trash though, so. Page 379 and earlier is the whole scene where Kaz gets beaten up, but also beats up the other people in Crow Club in order to recruit them. You have two minutes to get out of my house, old man. The city's price is blood, said Kaz, and I'm happy to pay with yours. That whole scene? is big dick energy right there. Page 460. But what about the rest of us? What about the nobodies and the nothings, the invisible girls? We learn to hold our heads as if we wear crowns. We learn to wring magic from the ordinary. That was how you survived when you weren't chosen, when there was no royal blood in your veins. When the world owed you nothing, you demanded something of it anyway. <sighs> Inej is just so amazing. In my last video, I said that Kaz is my favorite character, but I think it might be Inej. Every scene of hers in this book is so fucking good. Everything that she says, everything that she thinks is so wise. It's so amazing to see her 
go through all the trauma and all the bullshit in her life and still come out of it with this hope for the world and this hope to have a better world. Ooh, shit. She is just so strong. She can be vicious, but she's not cruel. She still has empathy and care and gentleness and it's just so, 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 so beautiful. I can't talk about this any further or else I'm gonna fucking cry my eyes out. Page 480 is when Kaz reveals that he chose one of the outbreak sites to be the menagerie. She smiled then, her eyes red, her cheeks scattered with some kind of dust. It was a smile he thought he might die to earn again. You know what would be like a cute first date idea? If they just sat on the rooftop and watched the menagerie burst into flames. That would be so romantic. Now let's address the elephant in the room. Here's the thing. I knew that he was gonna die. Um, since the first book because I had read spoilers about it. And that's why in my Six of Crows video, I was saying that I refuse to have an opinion on him because having an opinion means that to some extent you are attached to the character. And I didn't want to be attached to him because he did. And I felt like I did a pretty good job at feeling lukewarm about him for the majority of the series until we got to that scene. What you say? This was the scene where I was sobbing my eyes out at 1 a.m. 2 a.m. I was still crying about it. And even today, I had to go to the bathroom during work <laughs> and tear up because I'm honestly so shook by it. Right before he meets that little boy soldier, he was going on his merry way to go back to Nina and he was thinking about the future that they were gonna have together. That was when I knew that he was literally gonna die in the next page because you can't have a character that's thinking about their future and is happy about it without them fucking, you know. What you say? When he got shot, <sighs> okay. Ooh, I'm not gonna cry, I'm not gonna cry. When he got shot, it was really, really devastating to me. And at first I felt like it was unnecessary for him to die because he didn't sacrifice himself really. He just died because some fucking 14 year old decided to shoot him who had no relevance to the story and wasn't even an important character. This kid just decided to take his life out and now he's gone forever. I felt like it could have ended with all six characters being alive because it's six of crows, not five of crows. That doesn't even sound right. But as I cried some more, and as I thought about it some more, I realize now that his death does have some merit to it. There was a reason for it, and there was a lot of symbolism for it. I realized this because the book talks a lot about these characters having shadows. Like Inej has that shadow, what the fuck was her name again? Dunyasha or whatever? First of all, she's a bitch. I'm glad that she died. But Dunyasha was Inez's shadow because Dunyasha was this very cold, unfeeling girl who delighted in giving pain to other people. And Inez decided not to be in that shadow. Pekka Rollins is also Kaz's shadow because he represents the man that Kaz could be. And in the same way, this kid is Matthias's shadow because he is basically who Matthias was years ago. Matthias had been brought up to be a very hateful person, just like the rest of the soldiers. The boy represented all of his past mistakes and all of the hate that he had spread. And in a way, it was kind of like his past was catching up to him and this was going full circle. So I understand why he had to die this way, but it doesn't make it hurt any less. <laughs> I can't believe I'm fucking crying right now. Oh my God. Oh, <sighs> okay. It just really sucks because he was one of the good ones, <laughs> you know? He had a whole future ahead of him where he could have contributed positively. He could have helped prevent the cycle of hate. And now because he's dead, he can no longer do it. And that fucking... <sighs> That fucking sucks. I think what hurts even more, like what makes my heart hurt so much just thinking about all of this, is knowing that it the book ended with Nina going off on that boat with Matthias's dead body. And it's just, it just fucking sucks. Just imagining her like that just makes my heart hurt so much. Like the death sucks in two ways. It sucks because we lost a really good character that had like all this character development and then it also sucks because now Nina is sad. And I can't have my Waffle Queen being sad. It's still so much of a shame that someone who could have had a really productive 
life and could have helped others was just cut so short. But I know that's life and <laughs> I think that's why it sucks. Page 497. He was on the ice once more and somehow he could hear the wolves howling. Oh shit. But this time, he knew they were welcoming him home. There are dogs in heaven, and Matthias is playing with all of them right now. I'll take that. I'll take that. I am such a mess. The last thing that I want to talk about before I just disintegrate into tears is the last scene with Kaz and Inej. I knew that Kaz had bought her a ship and that he was going to reunite her with her parents. I knew this because, again, I had accidentally read spoilers about it, but I still bawled like a baby when I was reading it because, one, I was still very emotionally fragile from the whole Matthias scene. I do think that has something to do with it. Like, my heart was already torn into pieces, but this was just like, what heart? You have none now. It's gone. First of all, Kaz is so whipped by Inej. He will do anything for her. I love it. I think that she will come back to him eventually. And I think that when they do... <sighs> I think that when they do, they will be better people. <laughs> oh my god, I am fucking crying in the club right now. The one thing that I will say about it is that I really love the way that their relationship had ended because they both clearly care about each other, but they also acknowledge that they need time to grow as individuals and to overcome their trauma on their own. Page 527. She understood suffering and she knew it was a place she could not follow, not unless she wanted to drown too. She would fight for him, but she could not heal him. She would not waste her life trying. I just think it sends such a positive message that for the trauma that you deal with, you have to do it on your own. You can't solely depend on other people. Like you have people who can support you, but the journey that you have to go through is something that you have to take on your own. And I love that they have become dependent on each other, but not codependent. And I know that in the future, they will be together. <laughs> Had she really thought the world didn't change, she was a fool. <laughs> the world was made of miracles, unexpected earthquakes, storms that came from nowhere and might reshape a continent, the boy beside her, the future before her. Anything was possible. I think what makes the story so beautiful is that it shows that change is possible and that people can change. Jesper is changing by letting go of his addiction. Wylan is changing by becoming more courageous and confident in himself. Kaz and Inej are changing because they are letting go of their trauma. Nina is changing by having a bigger agenda to improve the world. And Matthias... <laughs> The wounds are still fresh, okay? Matthias has changed by becoming someone who was racist, misogynistic, and close-minded to someone who has such a big heart <laughs> and a big bullet hole. <laughs> I can't make proper jokes because I am just too emotional right now. In conclusion, this was an amazing book. I've never cried and <laughs> had my voice crack talking about a book before. Crooked Kingdom was amazing and probably the closest to perfection that I'll have in a book. It's just amazing. And if you have also cried reading this book, hit me the fuck up because I think we should all cry together because that's how you deal with grief, right? You reach out to people, you talk to people. I don't know how to end this. I just, I'm very broken right now and I need some time to grieve. Thanks for watching. Bye. If you love me, let me go.